Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, Hybrid IT and the Government, sponsored by QTS on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guests today are Sanjay Gupta, the Chief Technology Officer for the Small Business Administration, Benjamin Bergenson, the Chief Information Officer for the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and Tim Burke, a Federal Cloud Product Manager for QTS. As we just finished up talking about security and the importance of SLAs, and we talked about what goes into good security, but the risk management and the SLAs, the other piece to this discussion I think we should touch upon is the decision about what type of cloud to move to, not hybrid, public, private, commercial, et cetera, but what the, when does infrastructure make sense? When does platform make sense? When does software make sense? I think software is probably the easiest one to know, but Ben, give me a sense, how are you guys decide where to move your workloads in terms of infrastructure, platform, software as a service? The key is going back to your mission and finding out what are specific needs for your organization. So for example, for email, for the mission requirements, it's live communication via smartphones and tablets and computers, and it's very service oriented. So that's a decision that you say, okay, we do software as a service or service as a service. The next platform is you see, okay, we have very agency unique application for data analytics and determining where we should do our next pilot program training or reverse trade mission for exports of US goods. That is a unique program, so it it isn't available as software as a service, and we have it for our use only, so that that goes down to the next level of platform as a service. And there's more risk involved and there's more development on our side because we have to develop the databases, create the applications. We have the underlying operating system and infrastructure, but we're, we have a shared risk. The next level is infrastructure as a service and it depends on what your requirements are and what your scope and scale is. So if you have a large scale and a large scope, you might be wanting to look all the way down at the hardware, and it depends on the mission service that you're trying to provide. We just had, last year, issues with air conditioning and heating, and I quickly resolved that because it you, you have to, <laughs> and you end up learning a whole bunch of things and I now know more than I ever did than about hot air exhaust. So it's not just about getting cold air in because that's easy or getting air movement but then you have to get hot air out and what happens if the building turns off their systems at a certain time but your dedicated system keeps running and you may want to be working in that space this is something that we're going to be moving out of and going to platform as a service and service as a service. It's different for every scope and scale. If you're a cloud provider or you're a larger organization, you may want to be in there. It's amazing when you become a, an expert on HVAC, when, <laughs> when you have to become that expert. Uh, uh, in interesting piece about the kind of, as you broke it down by the difference of whether it's software or platform or infrastructure, do you lean one way? Do you do mostly infrastructure? Or do you do mostly platform? or I know you said it depends on the workload or what you're trying to get done, but where do you see USTDA doing, you know, kind of leaning? Most of our stuff is going to go to shared services and service as a service. So software as a service. And software yeah. as a service, where everything is through a web portal. We will be doing our data analytics on a platform as a service, because that's a custom legacy application that needs things that we have an on-site developer that can work on, and almost no infrastructure as a service. Okay, because you can move that data analytics to the cloud, but yes. you still need, there's certain pieces you still need to touch, per se, versus yes. a software title is, is different. Uh, Sanjay, talk about SBA, what, what, are, what is your vision of where you guys are heading? I mean, are you, obviously you'll have a little bit of everything, but where do you see most of your efforts going, or how do you make those decisions? Yeah, good question, Jason, and I think just to add to what Ben was saying, if I kind of draw the continuum of on-prem to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, on the on-prem environment, the customer or consumers, the agency is responsible for managing everything, managing support everything. On the far end of the spectrum is the software as a service where there's nothing that the consumer of the service has to manage. It's all provided by the service provider. 
So, so that's sort of the continuum, and the way we are uh, targeting at SBA is right now we're moving to largely infrastructure as a service model. Uh, and as we continue to mature, we'll move to platform as a service and software as a service. Having said that, we're also looking for spot opportunities. Let me give you a case in point here. So for instance, as we're migrating some of our applications, each application has a database. And we're saying, rather than standing up multiple database servers, we have an option of using platform as a service offering for database services. So what we'll be using is consuming database services as platform as a service as opposed to standing up our own databases as an example, right? Uh, so, so we're looking at opportunities to look for where we can utilize platform as a service. And then obviously our, our long-term vision, long-term being over the next three to five years, is ideally to be largely in the software as a service category. We recognize that we'll never be 100% there. So we will continue to have some infrastructure as a service, some platform as a service, and some uh, in, uh, software as a service. But that's where we want to intend to, is become heavily on the right side of the spectrum. Do you foresee just never having a data center at all? Absolutely. Uh, our data center at uh, SBA, come end of December or early next year, there will, no, no, will be nothing called a data center anymore that we have today. It'll be just a server closet with maybe three or four racks left in there. And, and, and that's a big change from, as you said, oh, the, the, the one you had where it was just yeah, yeah, filled yeah. with. When Maria came in, you know, it was like uh, all kind of environmental problems and all kinds of uh, uh, stability problems. So yes, we will just uh, you know, be out of there. So again, reiterating our, our cloud first strategy is we are committed to it, and so we will not be adding more investments into our data center. Tim, again, react to what you've heard from Ben and Sanjay in the sense of, are other agencies following a similar path, maybe starting with IAS and then moving towards platform and software? It also, so yes, and it, yes. Also <laughs> it also depends on if it's an agency customer for QTS or a system integrator customer for QTS. So we will start with the agency first. And much of the conversation is the same depending on no matter which customer it is. It's really a roles and responsibility discussion. I mean, if we don't collectively have a roles and responsibility discussion on who manages what, um, it's going to be a really fuzzy picture and the accountability and the success is going to have a, a less likelihood of, of achieving the outcome. So we actually, some of our, even agency customers come in and say, well, which one should I use? And the typical question is, what do you want to manage? What do you want to monitor? What do you want to patch? What do you want to remediate on? Now, we play mostly in the infrastructure as a service layer. Right, as a hosting provider. But many of our customers right, are software as a service providers, whether it be endpoint management, storage, conferencing services, and a myriad of other things, including test dev. So those software as a service providers, they've already made the decision they're going to pursue providing services to agencies. And then they're also making that same decision on a roles and responsibility perspective and discussing with us. So they, they can go ahead and provide a specific compliant and secure level of service. So it, we always hear about the, hug, the server huggers, right? The people mm -hmm. who don't want to let go of that server, the blinking light. Are you finding that when you have that discussion with roles and responsibilities, again, we're going to put a blanket statement over this. Generally, agencies start with, no, no, I have to see the lights, and they end with, well, just, just make it work. I mean, do, do you see that happening more and more? There are other shades of uh, other shades in between. The <laughs> so there's a, I, I kind of have my server, and I'm never, I'm never letting anybody else touch it. Some of them say, okay, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and start getting into a commercial services provider data center, and I'm going to choose a product co-location. I leverage my CapEx investment. I leverage some of the services from the service provider. I can still touch my gear. So it's kind of, I can hug it, but maybe from afar. And then you've got other folks that are choosing, you know, amongst our cloud portfolio of how much they still want to manage, right? How much do I want to take on of continuous monitoring and kind of flexibility that I have there? Or do I fully want to outsource that part to the service provider? So there's this in between. I don't want to touch it, or I always want to touch it. And then and it goes back to each workload, particularly who, you know, within your organization, you probably have the same, you definitely have the same discussions. Which group do I want to save time and money for? And it may, that may differ based on application, whether it's the compliance team or the ops team. And you know, I just want to keep my staff engaged and doing the cool things. I mean, who wants to be up at you know, three, between 3 and 6 in the morning on Saturday morning uh, doing patching? Or right? worrying about a server that went down that may not be needed right. until Monday, but you can't wait till Monday to exactly. address it either. Right. Uh, ben, uh, Tim brings up an interesting uh, concept here when you talk about roles and responsibilities. One of the things as part of that is the, the customer side, and you guys have moved to shared services, you guys are, are moving to the cloud, you mentioned Office uh, 365. How, how do you deal with the customer side of this equation? You may say from a CIO's perspective, 
uh, software as a service makes the most sense, but what if the customer is, is not so happy about it or doesn't quite understand what that means? Talk a little bit about customer satisfaction that's you know, non-IT, the, the mission side. So a big part of the move to shared services and cloud services is the, the training and the outreach and the collaboration with your customer base. And I mean, the move to the cloud if you've done it before, you've moved from one data center to another, or you've moved to co-locations, that's the technical piece. That, that will happen, and it'll be a success. What you want to spend a lot of your time on is asking your customers what they want and listening to them and letting them make the decisions. That's a, a big difference instead of saying, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do platform as a service or we're going to do software as a service. Say, okay, tell me what you're trying to get to and be able to work the conversation to find out what it is they actually are looking for as outcomes as opposed to, well, I want this technology or that technology. Say, okay, I'm looking for the ability to always have access to my files and by the way, I'm traveling to three different countries and there are three different telco providers depending on what country we're in. And how do we make that secure and elastic? I might need four or five more smartphones or tablets when we get there and then I want them to go away when I leave. Say, okay, that, now I'm understanding what it is you're looking for. So if you start with what the customer wants and what the, the mission operators are looking for, that's how we ended up getting moved our personal drives because everyone loved it, it was always available. That's how we are moving our video teleconferencing to the cloud is without spending any additional money, we found it in an existing contract, bundled in and said, well, we're already paying for it so let's start to use it. But you don't just turn it on because the customers aren't aware of it. You, you say, okay, what are your pain points? What are you looking to do? I said, well, I want to lower my phone bill. So we can do that with cloud-based video teleconferencing. I also want to be able to talk to people in three or four different time zones, and I want it to be simple and easy and not have to worry about any configuration settings. I said, okay, that then makes it a very successful rollout. Uh, Sanjay, Interesting what Ben brings up is the outcome. You brought that up several times. Uh, SBA has got to have a very similar, but you have a whole different set of uh, customers. Yours are, 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 are much different than what Ben's dealing with. Talk about how you guys are measuring outcomes. Yeah, so for us, the cloud migration is supposed to have zero impact on the customer. It needs to be transparent. So what's the simple manifestation of a cloud migration is we have migrated to the cloud. The customer has no idea that we are now running in the cloud because all of the applications and the services and the outcomes that were being delivered are being delivered in a transparent fashion. So for us, that's the simplest measure of customer satisfaction that we move to the cloud and the customer has not seen any difference in whatsoever that they've been using the services. Uh, so that's what we are aspiring to at SBA and that would be our measure of uh, how well we performed in our uh, cloud migration here. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at. We definitely believe that for SBA's OCIO, uh, patching, running, maintaining servers is not adding to the mission's value add. Uh, we believe that this is something we can better defer to a cloud service provider like a QTS or whoever else that we are working with and let them handle that because that's their core competency. It's no longer our core competency. Our core competency is helping our program officers deliver to the mission and the values of our agency. So that's where we are looking at from a long-term perspective. Tim, talk a little bit about the customer service piece because that's a, you have a different set of customers. You have both the federal agencies, but as you mentioned, systems integrators too. Sure. So, and and to that point, while our customers and go that through that whole spectrum, you know, the folks that we work with directly are the operations teams um, from the agencies, and customer satisfaction can be measured in different ways. I mean, you can get a call from your account team and see what's going on, or there can be some visibility into an issue that came up. Um, but at QTS, we do things a little bit differently. And the question you need to ask when evaluating a, a provider is, who knows what your satisfaction is and how do they know? So we work off something called a net promoter score. Not sure if folks are familiar with that, but it's an, industry, it's an average or a measurement of satisfaction. And every Monday, the entire company, 
every single employee gets a report on the Net Promoter Score for transactions for the previous week. So the progression is, if you open up a service desk ticket with us, you have the opportunity to take a, a basically a two-question survey. Are you satisfied with the interaction? And are you willing to promote QTS to somebody else? And we get the unfiltered feedback. And there's also an action item following each thing that doesn't hit a score that we prefer. So there's the, the visibility. How are we doing? We, everybody knows every week how we're doing, and on average. And the accountability for following up and making sure our customers are satisfied is there and has complete visibility across. So the, how do you know? Well, we take an extra step and make sure we measure and have that visibility. We talked about SLAs a little bit earlier mm -hmm. in the discussion. Does that does customer satisfaction get folded into SLAs? Are you seeing that more and more? Absolutely. And then give me a sense of how that works. Because it just can't be I'm satisfied or I'm not satisfied, and it yeah. can't. And, and any kind of a subjective scoring, you know, must get a 10 out of 10. So, yeah. So the I, typical manifestation of that is the scoring is the average satisfaction rating over the month or over the quarter or, and over the year of an interaction. So for example, um, some of the measurements are, you know, if 10 is the best and 8 is the, is the next tier down, that 85 or 90 percent are an 8 or some measure like that. So we have a, a quantitative measure, right, of the experience and the perception of the experience. And there are and, and can be and, and are in some cases financial penalties for that. So we're motivated in many ways, not just <laughs> internally and, 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 and contractually. Okay. But you know, if we don't do, if we don't keep our folks satisfied, you're just not going to be a customer for very long. And, and I think uh, the internal piece is also important. Get, people know that people are happy or not happy. It also gets a little motivation too. And the finance, or financial penalties also are, uh, are key. Uh, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating conversation. Unfortunately, though, we are out of time for today. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, well, you've been listening to the panel discussion, Hybrid IT and Government, sponsored by QTS, on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I've been your host, Jason Miller. I'd like to thank my guests today, Sanjay Gupta, the Chief Technology Officer for the Small Business Administration, Ben Bergerson, the Chief Information Officer for the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and Tim Burke, a Federal Cloud Product Manager for QTS. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsradio.com and search QTS. On behalf of QTS, thank you for joining us. A link to the archive session will be sent to you shortly. If you qualified for continuing education credit, you will also receive an email with your training certificate. This concludes our discussion. Thank you.